Hi there, Augie Kennedy here. Welcome back to Super Awesome Calculus. We're in chapter two, which is taking it to the limit. <laughs> and um, today we're going to go over section 2.6, which is all about limits at infinity. And before we do that, and we're just so close to derivatives, we are so close, I can taste it. In fact, next lecture, we're going to be talking a little bit about derivatives and introducing the idea. But first, let's talk about the big problem from last time. Last time, we talked a lot about continuity and we introduced the intermediate value theorem. So for the big problem, I asked you to consider the case of a Tibetan monk who leaves the monastery at 7 a.m. and takes his usual path to the top of the mountain, arriving at 7 p.m. The following morning, he starts at 7 a.m. and takes the same path back, arriving at the monastery at 7 p.m. Use the intermediate value theorem to show that there is a point on the path that the monk will cross at exactly the same time of day on both days. Now, there are probably quite a few ways that you could have done this. But the way I do this is I like to look at all of those words and I like to glean some information. So what do we know? We know that there's a monk, this guy right here, we know there's a monk. And we know that there's a monastery right at the bottom here and at the top there's, there's, there's our monk guy. There's a monastery and here's the mountain and it goes to the top of the mountain. He walks up and it takes him from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. That's 12 hours. It takes him 12 hours. Okay? And then the next day he comes back down and it takes him the same amount of time and he leaves at 7. And I want to prove that at some point on this trip he was in the same spot both days. So let's look at how I do this. Well, let's, let's, uh, let's understand that his trip up the mountain and his trip back from the mountain are two different functions, okay? So let's call day one f of t, since we're dealing with time here, f of t is first day, and g of t is the second day, okay? Now, we, well, what do we know? Well, we know that at F0, at the beginning of the day, at 7 a.m., he was at 0. Let's call 0 equals monastery. Let me write this bigger. 0 equals monastery. And D equals mountaintop. So f of 0 is 0. 12 hours later, f of 12, if we're going by hours, is d. Meanwhile, g of 0 is d, and g of 12 is 0. Okay, you see how that works? Now, what do we know? We know from looking at this picture right here that it's continuous, that f and g are continuous. And what we can do, actually, is we can make a graph of sorts about this. So let's look at a graph. We're going to stay in the first quadrant. Here's 0. Here's 12. And here's d. This is f of x. And then the way back down that's g of x. Now we can see already that this is going to work. We can see right there, for instance, that it's going to work. But we know it's continuous because he was always walking on the path at some point, in both cases. So that means that theoretically, if both are continuous, we could say that f minus g uh, works. So f of g minus g of 0 f0 is going to be negative d, and f minus g of 12 is going to equal d. So we know at this point that there is something in between 0 and 12 wherein they are going to meet. And the way that we formally write that is 0, somewhere less than c, some number, which by this graph, which is not probably the real graph, C would be right there, which is less than 12. 
And that's how you prove using the intermediate value theorem that that monk did in fact pass the same spot on both days. What that spot is, I don't know. And you don't need to know. And I certainly won't know. So, now we're going on to what the uh, topic of today is, and that is limits at infinity and horizontal asymptotes. Let's look at this, this, uh, this function right here. f of x equals x cubed. Okay? f of x equals x cubed. We know what this looks like. Here it is. It looks kind of like that. Now, what if I say, tell me the limit as x approaches 1 of x cubed? Well, that's easy. You just plug 1 in because it's a polynomial, and polynomials are continuous everywhere, so you'll be able to use direct substitution. 1 cubed is 1. Great. But what if I asked you the limit as x approached infinity, some huge number? What would happen? Well, it turns out that you'd be using something like infinity cubed, which such a thing doesn't even exist. So what we'd say is that that limit is going to infinity. The bigger you make x, the bigger you're going to make x cubed. So that's, that's the idea of taking a limit at infinity. You might be wondering, why would this ever be useful? Well, there are ways to make it useful. Let's look at the following example. f of x equals x squared minus 1 over x squared plus 1. And I want to know the limit as x approaches infinity. Can you tell me that? Well, from the ways that we've... Um, I mean, we could look at it graphically. We could look at it graphically. Uh, but without a graphing calculator, that might we'd need to plot points. But if we plotted points, negative 1, we'd see that it would look somewhat like, boy, that's embarrassingly bad, but that's basically what it looks like. OK. OK, well, what else? Is there anything else that we can do? We can. We can look at the leading power. Remember, we talked about order of polynomials before. This is a pretty nifty trick when you're trying to figure out limits. If we have x squared minus 1 over x squared plus 1, and a number as big as infinity, the minus 1s and the plus 1s, they don't matter. Because if we're talking about infinity, we certainly don't care about plus 1, minus 1. So now we're looking at x squared over x squared. Well, we know that they're the same order, and therefore the answer is 1. And sure enough, 1 is the limit. And we draw a little horizontal asymptote right there. You'll notice you can do this exact same thing with f of x equals 1 over x at infinity, limit as x approaches infinity. If 1 over some really huge number is going to be very, 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 very small. In fact, it's going to be very, very close to 0. And therefore, that's why we not only have vertical asymptotes in the function of, in the graph of f of x, we have horizontal asymptotes at 0, because the bigger or you, you go in either direction, positive or negative, you're going to have a very, very small number. It will never be zero, but it will be very, very, very close to zero, as big as you want to make it. So that's the idea of a horizontal asymptote. Horizontal asymptotes generally work the same way as vertical asymptotes. We remember that a horizontal, we remember a vertical asymptote generally occurs where the function is undefined. So for instance, well, with x squared plus 1, that function is going to have a domain of all real numbers. But with f of x, f of 1 over f of x equals 1 over x minus 1, if we have x is 1, 
we're going to get a denominator that's zero. So we'll have a vertical asymptote. For a horizontal asymptote, we ask the limit as x approaches infinity. What is it? What is it? If the limit as x approaches infinity of any f of x equals L, if it equals a number, then we have a horizontal asymptote that's going to be at that number. Sure, right as rain. All right, now, some examples of some functions that have horizontal asymptotes. Well, we looked at some when we looked at the inverse trig functions. We remember arctan, or if you prefer, tan inverse f of x. You remember that. Well, we know arctan looks like this. It's the tangent function, but flipped over. We have pi over 2, negative pi over 2, 0. And you remember that pi over 2, negative pi over 2, something like that. So what that means is that the limit as any number, the limit as x approaches infinity, of arctan x equals pi over 2. And it also means that the limit as x approaches negative infinity, infinity in the negative direction of arctan x, we know that that's negative pi over 2. You can see the horizontal asymptote right there. So that is that's something else to consider. Now, whenever we find out limits, I'm going to spare you the brute force computations, but it's important to know some of the tricks, like reducing by a power. For instance, if we see a function like this, the limit as x, I'm making this one up, so bear with me, as x approaches infinity of 3x cubed minus 2x squared plus 7 over x cubed plus 2x minus 8. Whenever we're dealing with a, something that looks like that, the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to break it down into orders. Just like we knew that the algebraic trick with a, if we see a square root in the numerator is to rationalize it by multiplying by a clever version of 1, here instead we're going to be more concerned with dealing only with the polynomials of the greatest order. So, at a number as huge as infinity, 7 and 8 aren't really going to matter. But here's the other thing. X cubed is going to grow at infinity much, much larger, much faster than X squared and X. So since we have degree 3 in the numerator and degree 3 in the denominator, we're going to get rid of them. And we're going to see that this is really asking, what is the limit as X approaches infinity of 3X cubed over X cubed? And we can see quite easily that that is 3. And therefore, there would be a horizontal asymptote at 3. y equals 3. Now, generally speaking, that's, uh, that's, the way that you're, that's the way that things are going to work. If you have, I'm just trying to make sure that this is absolutely correct. If you've got a rational function, We've got a rational function. Oh, my marker, you picked a, such a bad time. Okay. If you have a rational function, you have x here and x here. If the degree in the numerator is higher than the degree in the denominator, then that limit won't exist. It'll be infinite. It'll be infinite. An example here would be x cubed over x. Well, that's basically x squared, and x squared at infinity is infinity. So that graph is going to not have a horizontal asymptote. If, the, if they are the same, 
Well, then we're dealing with one or whatever coefficients c of x cubed over d of x cubed, whatever, whatever constants are in front of that, that is what is going to be c over d. Okay? And things get a little bit interesting. For instance, if we have 4 down here and 1 up there, then we've got 1 over x cubed. And then you, you are probably going to have vertical as well as horizontal asymptotes. Uh, one other very quick thing to go over. This, chapter was very, this section was very short. One other thing to go over is the uh, we'll revisit our old friend f of x equals e to the x. We remember the exponential function. The limit as x approaches infinity of e to the x is infinity. Infinite, e, e to the infinity is infinity. It's huge, huge. But if we remember the shape of the graph, limit as x approaches negative infinity of e to the x, well, that equals 0. And we can see that very, very easily. We can plug in the numbers if we want, or we can just look back at the graph. And we can see if this is 1. There's going to be an asymptote right there. So as we head to negative infinity, it's going to 0. And that's, uh, that's something that's good to know. And basically, we're, we're set. There are a lot of things like rationalizing, numerators, denominators, a lot of algebraic tricks that I'm going to A, hope that you've retained somewhat, um, B, pick it, try to brush up on, or you know, we saw the rationalizing the numerators, we've seen reducing powers, sometimes you'll need to divide by a common factor. These are all things that you might need to do to figure out a limit. If you don't know them, you could brush up on them, or you could just keep watching here and we'll attack them at some point. All right, well, I really hope that you enjoyed our little observation of horizontal asymptotes and limits at infinity. Next time, next time, we get to talk about derivatives. For the first time, we get to really talk about them. But before that, I've got a problem for you. Here's today's problem. When we study differential equations, we will be able to show that under certain assumptions, the velocity of v of t of a falling raindrop at time t is the, is the function v of t equals v times the quantity 1 minus e to the g t over star, where g is the acceleration due to gravity and v star is the terminal velocity of the raindrop. So what I want you to do is find the limit as t approaches infinity of v of t. And b, graph v of t if v star equals 1 meters per second and g equals 9.8 meters per second squared. How long does it take the terminal velocity of the raindrop to reach 99%? How long does it take for the velocity of the raindrop to reach 99% of its terminal velocity? Now this is, admittedly, a pretty serious question. Over v, yeah, gt over v star. Make sure that you get that right. The, uh, the equation here, it was kind of hard to copy. Here's the function, v of t equals v star times rats. Sorry about this. v of t equals v star times 1 minus e to the negative gt over v star. It's very important that you see that because it didn't really come out correctly on Microsoft Paint. So there you go. And I look forward to going over the answer next time. Bye-bye.